we had started the final section of the Mundak Upanishad, and we started with a glorious uh, mantra. Savedaitat paramam brahmadhama yatra vishvam nihitam bhati shubhram. Um, the enlightened one has realized the transcendent Brahman. And where is the transcendent Brahman? Right here. Yatra vishvam nihitam bhati shubhram. Where this, this universe, which we are exper experiencing, we are all experiencing it right now. But for the enlightened one, it shines holy. In Gambiranji's translation, beautiful translation, which shines holy. Uh, you see, because it is pervaded by that ultimate reality, because it's Brahman alone shining forth as this universe. It's no longer universe. It's no longer people and places and good and bad. It's one divinity through and through. And it's your own self. And those who uh, adore, worship, follow such an enlightened sage, upasate purusham hyakama. So they, if, they if they are qualified, if they give up worldly desires, shukram mati vattante dhira, they will eventually, they will also attain enlightenment and the result will be they will transcend the cycle of birth and death. All right. Now a question arises. Why don't people, uh, why don't we see people attaining this if it's so glorious? Why is it so difficult and who will attain it? Who can attain it? Why is it difficult and who can attain it? Uh, two verses, two mantras, second and third. The second mantra is, what do we give up? And the third mantra is, what do we need? Second mantra. Kamanya kamayate manyamana sakama bhir jayate tatra tatra pariyapta kamasya kritatmanastu ihaiva sarve praviliyanti kama. Um, a translation from Swami Gambhirananduji. He who covets desirable things while brooding on their virtues is born amidst those very surroundings, along with the desires. But for one who has got his wishes fulfilled and who is self-poised, all the longings vanish, even here. So, why is it difficult to attain enlightenment? Who can attain enlightenment? And if you do not, what happens? The consequence of not attaining enlightenment. Kamanya kama yate manyamana. So, objects of desire, could be sensual desire, sense pleasures, uh, objects of lust and greed, or um, power or position. And some of them, some may be degrading and gross, some may be refined, you know, like art and, uh, you know, uh, or something like attaining to positions of power in, um, in organizations or in nations. So the pursuit of power and success or the pursuit of straightforward greed and lust and um, all of those kaman and the objects which are desired, um, those are called kaman. Yah kama yate, those who desire them, who, those who are hunger and thirst after these, these worldly objects. Why do we do so? Um, it is because we find ourselves wanting, limited. We seek satisfaction. And we are not satisfied. We are not happy the way we are. And we feel, here are those things. If I can add them to myself, I will be fulfilled. Clearly, when you are hungry, you need food. And when you are cold, you need shelter and warmth. You need education, a modicum of company. All of those are there. But we, our desires are multiplied far beyond the basic minimum. And that's because we seem to have a bottomless pit within ourselves. We need this validation from others. We need this fulfillment which we seek emotionally from others. We hunger like vampires, you know, sucking emotional blood from others. Uh, we uh, want, we, we hunger for sensual pleasure. We hunger for power over others. All seeming to, bottomless, limitless. Show me the millionaire who doesn't want to be a billionaire. Show me the billionaire who doesn't want to add more billions to his already many, many billions and so on. Show me the billionaire who doesn't want to be president. You know? So this goes on. 
kamaan ya kamayate why do we have this state is there any um uh, escape or any uh, you know solution to this problem yes we have this state because actually it hides a great truth we are we have somewhere the memory or the recognition of our own infinite nature and because we actually are this infinite we are immortal beings we seek to live forever we hunger for life all the time but thing is we seek it in these limited mortal bodies because we think this is who we are i am limitless and i am this body equals to trying to living living continuously prolonging this limited biological existence similarly i am joy and bliss itself and so i must continuously experience my joyful blissful nature and how mm, through uh, you know food and drink and merry making and relationships and in, in every possible way whatever the thousand and one ways the world suggests to us we must be happy we are pleasure seekers we are happiness seekers we are knowledge seekers because we are consciousness itself but so the, we seek to know and understand everything whether it is a scientist probing the depths of the cosmos or the secrets of life itself or it's just a person who reads the gossip columns in the newspaper nobody reads nowadays you know on social media or something seeking knowledge we all want to know we, we don't what is it called fear of missing out a fomo huh? so it it hides a great truth about ourselves that we are infinite and that's why we seek limitless satisfaction we cannot be satisfied unfortunately we are seeking it in the wrong place and that's why we are disappointed again and again and again what's the right place to seek it then vedanta has this dramatic thing you're seeking the wrong place wrong place is outside right place is you yourself inside means you yourself your real nature because we do not know our limitless real nature we feel apurna not complete incomplete and therefore comes desire so from ignorance of our real nature comes desire shankaracharya is one of his favorite phrases avidya kama karma because of ignorance because of not knowing our infinitude own infinitude we find ourselves as body mind and we feel we are limited because of thinking of ourselves as limited then we try to become unlimited because remember somewhere there's an intuition of our unlimited nature and then we seek it in the body through the body in the world uh, we seek it there avidya ignorance leads leads to kama desire and desire leads to karma desire prompted action i must do things to fulfill my desires and once we have desire prompted actions what happens they give rise to results the results of uh, of karma uh, and the results are pleasure and pain and this perpetuates the cycle as we get the results we want we want to avoid the pain we want to get more of the pleasure and we engage in further desire prompted action and the results will keep coming and we are pushed from one lifetime to another lifetime because the results we have to get the results of our own karma and that gives rise to newer and newer embodiments we'll talk about it so kama bhir jayate tatra tatra because of those very results because of those that karma which has come from from desire kama bhir means because of being prompted by desire that one is born there and there with those and those results what does it mean whatever we desire and we work for it we will actually get it so i'm very kind to say do not desire anything because you will get it that sounds great right <laughs> the universe is a desire fulfilling machine it's our cosmic amazon prime whatever we want throw out into the universe we'll get it yes but it's also a terrible machine i remember reading houston smith i mentioned this earlier uh, he says to one way of making sense of hinduism is hinduism is telling us you can have whatever you want but that opens up the great great and primeval ancient even more ancient than ancient primeval question what do we want and it's a terrible question remember reading all those stories in every culture of gods or demons or or the jinn appearing from the magic lamp whoever every culture has these stories of supernatural powers appearing before you and asking what do you want and none of those stories end well none of those stories end well all of them they will say what we want and they will get them and you get into trouble none of those stories also have this 
I don't want anything. <laughs> that would have been interesting. I don't want anything. Vedanta says, it's because we want these things, we will get them. And we prolong this limited existence, lifetime after lifetime, being whirled around and trying to fulfill ourselves from fulfill this bottomless empty well within ourselves from the limited uh, world. You know, when we studied economics, we always learned that uh, um, economics is the science which tries to satisfy unlimited human wants with limited resources. So trying to satisfy uh, the first definition we were taught in the first class in economics. It's impossible. Unlimited human wants with limited resources. And it goes on. So what will be the results of karma being prompted by these? We act and the results of action lead us to um, being born again and again in different worlds, in different lifetimes. And these, remember, these desires are of two types. Shankaracharya will say, drishta adrishta. Drishta means seen, uh, money, um, success, sense pleasures, uh, the, all these are seen, family, children, these are seen, power. And Adrishta is and the unseen, promised by religion. So the Vedic religion, the Karma Kanda, which precedes the Upanishads, it promises a variety of heavens. Lead a pious life, perform the Vedic rituals, and after death you will go to an, a heaven of your choice, whatever you have earned by your Vedic uh, merit. So there also, what will you get? More pleasures, more, more limited happiness, which you will keep getting again and again. So you will be born tatra tatra, there and there. Where and where? Wherever you have imagined and worked for. Not just imagined. Economics again, it's interesting. Demand, the next thing we were taught. Demand, what is demand in economics? It's different from the demand which we have in day-to-day -day life. Demand is the desire for a thing and the ability to pay for it and the intention of paying for it, the willingness to pay for it. So desire for a thing. We have the desire for many, many, many things. Go ahead and fulfill it. Now you can, with one click, you can fulfill your desires. No, but it's expensive. <laughs> it's not free. So I, have, I must have the ability to pay for it. That also is not enough. I have money and I have this desire, but I won't pay for it. I won't pay for it. Um, so because uh, it's too expensive. So you must, that still does not constitute demand in the sense of economics. The economics demand is you must want it and you must have the ability to pay for it and you must be willing to pay for it. Then it becomes demand and the, um, the providers, the suppliers are interested you, in you in that case. Um, similarly, the Vedic thought was you must have a desire and the ability to work for it and the willingness to work for it then you will get the result of that desire. But that just perpetuates our limited existence. You will be born in this world and in other higher worlds later on. Uh, and those everything will come to an end. And you come back again to this world to generate further karma. And that is only assuming we have good karma. If we have bad karma, then we will not get what we want. We will get suffering. We will get kicks and blows in life. Pain in life. Um, pleasure in life, what we want will be satisfied if we generate enough good karma. If we, if we do not generate enough good karma, pain in life. And then we'll be born in lower worlds. He's not talking about that. He's talking about if you have good karma, this world, higher worlds, again back to this world. None of it is very spiritual. It's all very worldly or otherworldly, but still worldly. Then he says, Manyamana. How does this happen? Manyamana. Gambiranji says, brooding over it, contemplating it. Bhagavad Gita, it talks about the second chapter. How do we come, spiritual seekers come to grief? How do we crash and burn? You know, uh, it says, um, Dhyayato Vishayan Pungsa, thinking about these desirable things, things of the world. That's what advertising wants to do, you know, it wants to, you know, to take up space in our mind. So thinking about it, then what happens? Sangas te shupajayate, sangat sanjayate kama, kamat krodho vijayate, krodhat bhavati sammoha, sammohat smriti bhangsha, smriti bhangsha buddhi nasho, buddhi nasha pranashyati. Eightfold step, eightfold, like Ashtanga Yoga or Ashtanga Marga Buddha or Ashtanga Yoga of Patanjali, 
is eightfold step to destruction, not to yoga or enlightenment. It's eightfold step to destruction. Uh, what happens? This is what he says. Manyamara. First, it starts with what is occupying our minds. And you think about it. And you think about it uh, in a good sense that this is nice. It would be nice to experience this. It would be nice to go there. At nice to have this gadget. Uh, nice to see this movie. And so on and so forth. Then what happens? Next, Sangha, an attachment grows. You be, notice we tend to repeat those thoughts. So think about it. After some time, attachment, stickiness grows with those patterns of thinking, of wanting. Then Sangha, Sanjaya, Tekama, a desire. So desire of what kind? Demand in the uh, economic sense. I want it. I'm willing to pay for it or work for it. Uh, I, I have the capacity to get it and I am willing to pay for it or work for it. So karma, it becomes an expressed desire. When that desire is frustrated, suppose um, um, somebody or something prevents me for, from fulfilling my desire. Immediately, all desire frustrated leads to anger. Just about in every case when there is anger, some desire has been frustrated. So as far as selfish desires are concerned. So they lead to anger. Kama krodho vijayate. From desire comes anger. It's just the flip side of desire. And from anger, smriti bhangsha. So our knowledge, here it means Vedantic knowledge, but it could just be common sense, good sense. It could just be my sense of my own standards and ethics, what I want, kind of person I think I am. Then smriti bhangsha, buddhi nasha. Um, the... the that uh, from the destruction of the memory of our knowledge comes the failure of intellect, the failure of decision making. Then we take wrong decisions. We say the wrong thing. We do the wrong thing. How do we know it's wrong? Because we regret it later. Nobody has to implicate us. We implicate ourselves. Um, within days, months or years, we'll say, I wish I had not said that. I wish I had not done that. I wish I could take it back. Uh, I could make those times of my life disappear. No, it will not disappear. So it is uh, karma done and it's a mistake. Buddhi nashat pranashyati. Um, so delusion from um, kama sanjayate krodha krodha bhavati sammoho. From uh, anger comes a fog of delusion. From a fog of delusion, our memory of uh, understanding and memory are obscured. Loss of understanding comes wrong action. And from wrong action comes destruction. Destruction means we do not attain our goals. Whether it's the highest spiritual goal of moksha or even other worldly goals. So manyamana, the root of it all is what is our mind dwelling on? What is going on in our minds? In contrast, who will get liberation? Paryapta kamasya kritat manastu iheva sarve pravilyanti kama. The one who is Paryapta Kama, who has given up all worldly desires and who is fulfilled by the self in the self. Or if you are a devotee, it's fulfilled in love of God. You do not, we do not need anything external to fulfill us. Our engagement with the world is only solely, you know, it could be just for the maintenance of the body. It could be just be an expression of our enlightenment. Or it could be for the welfare of others. But no particular selfish end is, end is there. Vivekananda says, don't extend the tentacle of selfishness. Don't extend the tentacle of selfishness. They're trying to draw in like a squid or an octopus, something from the world. And like, a, and like an octopus, we extend all eight tentacles towards the world and trying to draw in things from the world. Just don't do that. The Pariyapta Kama, the one who is completely fulfilled, the joy of the self, of the self capitalists. Um, Kritatmana, the one who has attained enlightenment. Shankaracharya here gives a very nice um, definition of Kritatmana means the person, literally, it means the person who has done what is meant to be done in life, the one who has fulfilled the goal of life. Shankaracharya gives a very precise Vedantic meaning of. Kritatmana. What he says is, the lower self characterized by ignorance. So the lower self characterized by ignorance is, I am this person and I'm quite convinced of it and that's the basis of all my thinking, speaking and action. So that is uh, characterized by ignorance. 
the person, the Kritatma, is the one who has shifted the identification from the lower self to the higher self. The higher self is, I am limitless consciousness. I am existence consciousness, please. I am Brahman. Expressing through this particular body and mind. Am I a physical being or a spiritual being? The one who has done what is to be done in life has shifted the identification from the physical being, the body-mind complex, to I am Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. I am of the nature of Shiva. I am of the nature of consciousness. I am of the nature of bliss. And this is my real nature. That person. So Shankaracharya's definition, Kritatmanaha avidya lakshanad apara rupad apaniyas svena parena rupena krita. So having changed the identification, shifted the identification away from this limited body-mind to the already present limitless awareness by one's Vedantic knowledge. The lower self characterized by ignorance and the higher self characterized by the enlightenment generated by the Vedantic knowledge. That person, Ihaiva Sarve Pravilyanti Kava, here itself, and in, important, this is a phrase which comes again and again, Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita, Ihaiva, here itself, in this life, you can do it now, right now, in this life itself. You don't have to wait for uh, going uh, for after death, a post-mortem uh, freedom or salvation, going to heaven. No, 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 right now. So, Ihaiva, and why not? It's already ours. So, we have to recognize that this already present freedom, Ihaiva, Sarve Pravilyante Kamaha, um, all the desires are forever dissolved for this enlightened one. This Ihaiva, this term, uh, it refers to Jivan Mukti, freedom in this very life itself. The possibility of freedom in this very life itself, now and here, not hereafter, now and here. That's the beauty of Vedanta. What's ultimately it's talking about, the Brahman, ultimate Brahman of existence, consciousness, please, it's talking about this very world itself, our present life. The freedom and the joy and bliss it's talking about, it's possible here and now, in this life itself. That's the beauty of it. The process it undertakes also is based on what we are experiencing right now. This body, this mind, this seer and the seen, these five layers of the body-mind, physical, pranic, mental, intellectual, and the causal body. Here and now, this waking, this dreaming, this deep sleep, this is enough to lead us to a freedom which is available also here and now. Sarve Pravilyante Kama. Shankaracharya comments here, Kama tad janma hetu vinashat na jayante. What it means is, because these desires are the cause of birth and rebirth, once all these desires are, are dissolved because of enlightenment, there is no further birth. There's, one is freed from the cycle of births and deaths. Alright, so this mantra told us about why it is difficult to attain enlightenment. Because of desires. What do we need to do to attain enlightenment? Back away from those worldly engagements and desires and attain enlightenment. What is the harm if we are not um, if we are not enlightened? He says here, Kama bhi jayate tatra tatra. There in those worlds, you will continue to be born again and again and again uh, and whirl around in this samsara, be dragged through samsara. Uh, Vivekananda says, Thine only is the rope, hand that holds the rope that drags thee on. Then let go thy hold, sannyasi bol, say Om Tat Sat Om. Now, the counterpart to this verse, to this mantra, is um, what is the positive uh, side, the yearning for self liberation? This one is the negative side, you give up. Sri Ramakrishna said, You see, two sides to his teaching. One is renunciation of lust and gold. The two fundamental things which ground us human beings as spiritual seekers in this samsara is lust and acquisition. What he called Kamini Kancha, lust and gold. And uh, he says that he was relentless about it, Sri Ramakrishna. You have to give that up, step aside from it, because that's what absorbs most of our energies and time and thinking. So that you have to set, uh, step aside from, at least mentally. The renunciation must be mental. And then 
um, the positive side. Sri Ramakrishna said, what is the one factor which enables you to get realize God? What is the one thing that is needful? Sri Ramakrishna would say, Vakulata, an intense aspiration, desire, and the heart cries out for God. Or at least stoke that fire, make it stronger and stronger. And they go together. Because it's the same energy. The same energy which flows out towards the world in lust and gold. Same energy which flows out towards the world in a hundredfold streams of desire. If it is dammed up and blocked and then redirected, it will become one overwhelming love of God, as Vivekananda puts it. Or a tremendous yearning for spiritual freedom. Vyakulata. That second one, Shankara, the Upanishad itself and Shankara also will comment on it. The intense desire for liberation. Mantra number three. Nayamatma pravachane na labhyo na medhaya na bahuna shrute na yame vaisha brinute te na labhya tasyesha atma vibrunute tanum swam. Another one of those very important Mundaka mantras. And the translation is This self is not attained through study nor through the intellect, nor through much, much hearing. The very self which this one, the seeker, seeks is attainable through that fact of seeking. The self of his own, um, the self of his re reveals its own nature. All right, we have to unpack this one. The core message here is, the mantra says, None of these practices which we undertake, pravachana, uh, pravachana, you know, pravachana, of course, is a word very common in Indian languages, which means a religious discourse, a spiritual discourse. Um, specifically, Shankaracharya here limits the meaning to Veda Dhyana, study and chanting of the Vedas. So lots of Vedic studies and chanting, regular chanting, which the traditional Brahmins used to do, some still do. Will that help you to become enlightened? No. And the Americans would say, nope. Then, Medhaya, a sharpened and purified intellect. Medha is intellect. And in uh, Upanishads, it means a purified and sharpened intellect, which will enable us to grasp the subtle truths or the subtle teachings of the Upanishads. So, Medha, will that help us? It's highly recommended across the Upanishads. He says, nope, that won't help. Na bahuna shutena. Not through much hearing of Vedanta talks. You hear lot, loads and loads of uh, YouTube lectures. Shruta means hearing and you can extend it. The method of becoming enlightened again and again we have been told in Vedanta is Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. So here Shravana is referred to and of course you follow it up, follow it up with Manana and Nididhyasana. Hearing, contemplation or, or reasoning. Hearing, reasoning and meditation. So that's supposed to give us enlightenment. He says no, it won't. Really, really, what is at the core of it is the way the language is given here is Yame Vesha Vrinute Tena Labhya Tasse Shatma Vrinute Tanum Swam. Who will attain to enlightenment? Who will get self realization? Uh, it, it says the self reveals, Atman reveals itself to the one it chooses. The Atman reveals itself to that seeker whom the Atman chooses. Now, that language is uh, good for uh, you know, the dualistic devotional. Uh, interpretation where it's talking about God. Who will get God realization, the vision of God? Whomever God gives is, is gracious upon by the grace of God, God chooses to whom you can only pray and surrender and so on and so forth. But in the case of Vedanta, the self knowledge, it becomes a little peculiar. This kind of uh, you yourself will reveal yourself to whomever you choose. <laughs> what does it mean? What it means, Shankaracharya explains. The self reveals itself to whom? Sankaracharya says here in his commentary, to the one who chooses the self. Upanishad says, the self reveals itself to the one it chooses. The self chooses. The Atman reveals itself to the one it, the Atman chooses. Now the question is, whom will the Atman choose? And Shankaracharya says, the one who chooses the Atman. You have to, we have to make this decision. Not once, continuously. To choose self-knowledge, self-realization, God-realization, whatever we call it, above everything else, all the time, consistently. This is what I want. 
This is what Sri Ramakrishna would call Vyakulata. A tremendous thirst and eagerness for God realization. Now notice, two sides of it. One is the giving up side of it, which we saw in the earlier verse. Giving up worldly desires. Otherwise, you'll be caught in the world of worldly desires. And, the, uh, and pulled down into worldliness. The second one we see here, the other side of the coin, is the intense yearning for God realization or self-realization. What does that mean? I choose self-realization. Then the self will reveal itself to me. The language is very interesting. Yame vesha vrinute. Whoever this, um, who chooses this self, to, it's to that one, the self will reveal itself. Self will reveal itself to whoever it chooses. Who will um, it uh, choose? It will choose the one who chooses it. The Atman will choose the one who chooses the Atman. That means we must want the Atman and it must be a genuine wanting as revealed in our stepping away from worldliness. And it's not very difficult to see because any um, human project, you want a great uh, degree from an Ivy League college or something like that. Uh, and uh, then you must make uh, sacrifices for it. If you say, I'm going to uh, party and go on vacations and spend time with my friends and so and so forth, and study maybe when if I have time, well, you will not get that degree. Look at the way the athletes train. They give up everything. They lead, lead virtually monastic lives to, uh, you know, before competing in their field of, um, you know, whatever sport they are in. So they give up in order to get something. And this is the rule everywhere, everywhere. Look at great scientists, artists, you know, painters, writers, musicians. When they are in the creative mood or the research mood, they virtually become monk-like because everything else drops away from their life. So they focus on what they want. So two sides to it. You can't have both. One cannot worship um, God and Mammon at the same time. Either you will worship the one and despise the other. So uh, this is from the from the gospel. Jesus Christ says this. Or you will want one and neglect or, or despise the, the first one. There is a subtler, more technical point here. The technical point is we cannot objectify the self and realize it. The technical point here is that the self is self-luminous. It reveals itself. Just like a light. The light reveals every other object in the room. But you don't need another light to reveal this light. The light reveals itself. All you need to do is look at the light. To whom will the light reveal itself? To the one who looks at the light. Um, this is the technical point which is discussed as Vritti Vyapti and Phalap Vyapti. I have mentioned this on other occasions. The pervasion by the mental modification, pervasion by reflected consciousness. Brief summary. And if you want details, you can find it in the text called Vedanta Sara. This is the epistemology of enlightenment. Um, how do we get any kind of knowledge? Because of two things. One is Vritti Vyapti. Pervasion by the mind. What does pervasion by the mind mean? You basically have to think about it. It has to come into your our minds through, maybe through the eyes or ears. You see it, hear it, or you read about it. Basically, the mind has to contem objectify it. This is called vritti vyapti. There has to be a vritti, modification in the mind about the object of knowledge. That's one. Now, consciousness is reflected. The Atman is reflected in that vritti, in the mind. That reflected consciousness now illumines the content of that vritti. The consciousness reflected in the mind illumines the content. Whatever is presented in the mind is illumined by the consciousness reflected therein. That is called phalabhyapti, pervasion by reflected consciousness. So knowledge is two things. All knowledge. Vritti vyapti, you must think about it. Phalabhyapti, uh, it must be illumined by the reflected consciousness. Then only you get the feeling, I know it. I get it. Any kind of knowledge. Except enlightenment, self-knowledge. In self-knowledge, um, the mind has to be focused, has to uh, 
think about, contemplate, bring into view the real nature of the self. It has to be turned upon itself into, into um, one's own real nature. How do you do that? Shravana, manana, nididhyasana. You hear about these things, you think about it. And, and then the reflected consciousness is not requ required to illumine pure consciousness. You don't need uh, uh, reflected light to illumine. You don't need moonlight to illumine sunlight. You don't need moonlight to illumine the sun. You need moonlight to illumine the earth at night. But when the sun rises, you don't need to need the moon to now reflect and, and shine on the sun and ref, uh, illumine the sun. The sun reveals itself. Similarly, when the mind um, gets, gets it right, what the self is, if it, when the clarity comes, that very clarity shows, allows it to recognize the self for what it is, but without objectifying. Because then it's flooded. It recognizes the light with which it is always flooded. We are you are ever immersed in the self, in limitless radiance, and that becomes clear. And that is called enlightenment. So, for ordinary knowledge, vritti vyapti is necessary, falabhyapti is necessary. Pervasion by mind is necessary, pervasion by reflected consciousness is necessary. For enlightenment, self-realization, pervasion by mind is necessary. That's why shavana, manana, niridhyasana is necessary. Study of the text, thinking about it, meditating upon it, necessary. But that does not reveal to us the Atman. The Atman reveals itself. So the deeper technical meaning of this is the clue to enlightenment. It says you have to choose the Atman means in our continuously, in our thought, in our understanding, in our reasoning, we must focus, focus, stay with it, stay with it. Will that reveal to us the Atman? No, the Atman will reveal itself. Because it's self-luminous. It does not require our mind to reveal. It does not require in technical words, alabhyapti. Um, pervasion by reflected consciousness. This issue comes up in the Vedanta Sara um, in an interesting way. A question is raised towards the end of Vedanta Sara when you come to the epistemology or the psychology of enlightenment. How does enlightenment happen? Precisely what do you mean by self-realization? So the question is asked, what is the role of the mind in self-realization? And two quotations are given from the Upanishads. One says, Manasai Vedam Aptabhyam. It is to be realized by the mind alone. Self-realization is done by the mind alone. Where else is self-realization? can't be done by your knees or your kidney. It has to be done by the mind alone. The other quotation shows it cannot be done by the mind. Yan manasana manute, which is not, um, cannot be thought about or grasped by the mind. Now, how can both of them be right at the same time? One says, by the mind alone you will get enlightenment. The other one says, by the mind you cannot do it. The Atman cannot be thought of by the mind. Then what does it mean? It, these two together gives you a clue to what is enlightenment. And then there's a discussion of vritti vyapti and phalab vyapti. Because vritti vyapti is necessary, so by the mind alone it can be realized. Because phalab vyapti is not necessary, by the mind it cannot be realized. So in that sense. This is one of Shankaracharya's uh, favorite quotes. It comes up again and again. That how uh, he who chooses the Atman, to that one the Atman chooses. Devotees also, those who love God in, in, in devotional, in the dualistic religion. This is exactly what is meant by surrender, faith and surrender. I constantly choose God, then God chooses me. That allows the grace of God to operate. Now a question might be, yes, yes, that's all right, but how do you constantly choose God? It's not that easy. See, the wanting, Sri Ramakrishna says, Vyakulata, the desperate desire for God, like Sri Ramakrishna himself, he wept and cried for the, the vision of the Divine Mother. That's called Vyakulata. That's what the Upanishad is talking about. But the problem with that is, you know, we all know, you cannot command somebody to want something. Either one wants it or one does not want it. It's like saying, eat, one can eat. If you ask me to eat, I can eat. But if you say, be hungry, how can I be hungry if I don't feel hunger? So, um, one can behave lovingly. One can behave affectionately and uh, caringly. But how can one feel affection, love and um, uh, care if one does not feel it internally? So, you cannot command a desire. It has to be generated. It has to come from within. So, that takes time. And uh, the clues are given here. That um, that first of all, stepping away from worldly desires. 
with effort. Yes, one might say that until one is enlightened, because the logic is because we do not know our Purnam nature, our infinite nature. That's why we feel limited and that's why we have desires. And yet because of these desires, we cannot come to enlightenment. We'll never know our Purnam nature or limitless nature. Isn't it a vicious circle um, that because of our ignorance, we are trapped in the samsara. Because of our, we are trapped in samsara and desire, we cannot overcome ignorance. by We cannot get self-knowledge. But it starts with the teaching, the desire for self-knowledge. Notice we already have the desire. That's an interesting thing. That's why we are present here. That's why we are taking all this trouble. That's why so many people are on the path, in whichever, whichever path they are. So the self, the desire for self-knowledge, this desire for enlightenment, nirvana, moksha, is a very, very strong desire in all of us. It's already there. We have to fan it. We have to purify it. And the struggle for stepping back from worldliness and uh, focusing more and more on the spiritual path. Sri Ramakrishna put it in very simple words. Vishaya virag ishwari anurag. A dispassion for vishaya, for objects, sense objects. And an increasing yearning and love of God. The mind by itself is not an enemy. Purified of worldliness, it runs to God. Like a little child runs to its mother, the mind runs to God. It's the source of the mind itself. But it's because we have distorted the mind. We have put so much junk in the mind and perverted the mind. The mind is sick now. And therefore, it, it cannot go to, to, to the divine. We need to purify it and give it treatment. Vishaya Virag, Ishwari Anurag. Sri Ramakrishna also gives the answer. Simple, such simple answer. Everybody can understand without even studying the Upanishads. He says, the more you go towards these, the more the West remains behind. So how do I give up these desires? He says, you don't have to. Don't struggle there. Struggle rather in the positive direction. Move towards God. Study, meditate, pray, serve. Don't struggle with the negativities. The more and more we fill up our time and energy with um, divinity, the more the worldliness will drop away, will slip away. One monk in the Himalayas, he put it this way. If you want to, if you are constantly surrounded by bad company, you know, um, criminals and cheats and uh, thieves, you, instead of fighting against them, it's very difficult. They'll beat you up. Instead of fighting against them, hang out with the cops. You know, make friends with the cops and hang out with them. So the, the criminals will, won't approach you. They'll step back. They'll slowly slide away from you. You know, So that way. Go more towards God. The uh, worldliness will drop away slowly. Uh, in one sense, it's direct. The reality is available right now. In another sense, it's long and convoluted because of the complications which we have made in our own mind. It's difficult to uh, cleanse the mind so easily. Now, one more point here before we move on. See, Pravachana, Vedic study or uh, religious talks, Medha, the purified and sharpened intellect, and Shruta, that means hearing, Shravana Manana He is not knocking them. He's not criticizing them. He says all of them are necessary, but by themselves they won't work unless the crucial factor is intense yearning for self-realization and a dispassion for the world. That's the engine. Otherwise, it'll all be half-hearted. It'll all be half-hearted. And we'll complain it doesn't work. We'll move forward two steps and slide back one step. So that fears moving forward towards God. That comes when there's an intense renunciation for the world and a yearning for God. Yes, then Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, they become powerful. The Medha, the purified and sharpened intellect, that becomes useful then. That will work. And uh, Pravachana, even the simplest of uh, religious teachings, we will take it to heart. Otherwise, Shankaracharya himself says, in the same class, when you teach Vedanta, some, a few understand what was taught, a few half understand it, uh, some partly and partly not, and a few understand completely the <laughs> opposite meaning of what, what was taught. And a few don't even know, they don't remember. And what was taught just came this way and came went out that way. And that's because of uh, uh, lack of uh, yearning. If we really want it, we'll be ever so attentive, ever so full of faith and conviction. We'll always feel, yes, yes. Josephine McLeod, disciple of Swami Viveka, disciple is, I mean, she was, but 
she all just re refused to call herself a disciple. She said, I'm a friend of Vivekananda. And she writes about Vivekananda. The first time I heard Vivekananda speak, it was truth. The second time I heard him speak, it was truth. And every time I heard him speak, it was truth. It speaks to you directly. That's because already we are ready. The, to the skeptic, it won't speak directly. To the faint, to the person who is, um, whose aspiration is faint, it will not speak so directly. Will, yes, but I have 10 more questions. But the seeker uh, who is turned away from the world and intensely wants this will say, yes, this is what I wanted. And I'm going to hold on to this and move forward. In this life itself, I will attain enlightenment. One more. This is also a follow-up on the fourth, uh, on the third mantra. Mantra number four. Nayamatma balahine nalabhyo nachapramada tapasova pyalingat etai rupaye yatate yastu vidwan tasye shatma vishate brahmadhama. Further instructions. Number four. Translation. This self is not attained by one devoid of strength, nor through delusion. Um, nor through knowledge unassociated with monasticism, but the self of that knower who strives through these means it enters into the abode that is Brahman. So three um, powerful practices have been prescribed here. These are advanced practices, by the way. We'll see. Self-realization is not possible for the weak, for those devoid of strength. Balahine um, Here, the meaning of bala, strength, uh, is, uh, it can cover a whole spectrum. Remember, even physical strength, physical strength, emotional strength, um, intellectual strength, uh, moral strength, then only spiritual strength. That's why Vivekananda emphasized all, all of it. That's the meaning of Vivekananda's famous exhortation. The, to play football, you know, you'll be closer to heaven by playing football rather than by reading the Gita. And then he explains that he knows, I, say, I know where the shoe pinches. It's uh, uh, through a vigorous body, it's through um, mental maturity, emotional strength and intellectual conviction. All these strengths are necessary, moral strength. But above all of them comes, Shankaracharya explains, Atma nishtha janita virya hinena. Balahina means, devoid of strength means, devoid of the strength which comes by living your life in accordance with the knowledge of the Atman. By living your life in accordance with what we know. We already know a lot. The problem is we don't abide by what we know. I, I love this saying. It was probably Plato who said it. To know the good is to do the good. To know good, to know the good is to is to be good. And we often immediately we think, no, that's not right. We all know what's good, but it's so difficult to be good. Yes, it's only because our minds are polluted and our will will is weak. We know something is right. We agree with it, but we can't do it. As the poet um, Eliot said, between the intention and the act falls the shadow. Between the intention and the act falls the shadow. I think it's Eliot. And the shadow is our own Im imperfect natures. So what the Greek philosopher meant was, if we had perfected ourselves, then what we know to be right, we would do it. There wouldn't be any hesitation. There wouldn't be any faltering. And that I see in the lives of the saints. What they know to be right, they execute it. What they understand, they follow it in their own lives. Sri Ramakrishna said this is a very, very powerful practice. One of the greatest things he admired was, said, Mon Muk Akkara, making your tongue and the mind the same. What you say is what you are. What you are is what you say. Don't claim anything more than what you are. And, um, um, you know, don't make a division between what we think internally and what we say and do externally. And we just deprive ourselves of most of our power by doing that. Now he says, Atma Nishtha Janita Virya, the vigor, the power that comes of standing on the Atman. Standing on the Atman means knowing that I am this limitless existence consciousness place. Now think, what does that mean? Even before self-realization, once we have clarity, 
Once these non-dual teachings have made sense to us and we begin to see, yes, that makes sense. Yes, this is right. Then confront the issues that life throws up. It's, then you'll realize why this, Vivekananda called this life a gymnasium. Then it will truly become a spiritual gymnasium. It, everything will help in our spiritual progress then. Little physical weakness, a little pain there and a little ache there. What is it to me? I am the limitless consciousness. Because of me, this body mind is illumined. It has its own existence because of me. Um, not it, it, it does not exist apart from me. What can a little pain or an ache do to me, the immortal consciousness or Brahman? And so, what you are doing, you are elevating the mind. Atman is already there. The mind which is sunk in body awareness or body consciousness, you are elevating it to Atman consciousness. Again and again, Sri Ramakrishna's words, the direct disciples like Swami Turiyananda and others in, in, in their elder years as disease uh, came, old age came and death came near, they would they repeat this, you know, oh my mind, let the body know its pain, pain. Let, let the body know its suffering or pain, you my mind remain in peace and joy. Shorit jane, rog jane, shorit jane, mon tu yanande thak. Let the mind remain in happiness. Now, what does that mean? How will the mind remain happily in peace in the midst of disease and old age and problems? It's only in this, centered in self-knowledge, that I am the Atman. Try it when emotional shocks come, when the ups and downs of life come. Can we men maintain mental serenity? Atman is serene anyway. Atman is pure consciousness. Even if I get tremendously upset, the self remains the same anyway. But can I prevent getting tremendously upset? Swami, Turiyan, uh, Swami Premeshanji asks a novice, what is the practice for a monk? Um, you know, um, so the novice says, it should, should be humble, you should put up with whatever the world throws at you. And Premeshanji says, no, that's cowardice. That's cowardice. You should go ahead and do whatever is right uh, as a monk. But he says, not to be upset. That's the practice. Don't let the world make you upset. And that's not easy at all. The world is making us upset all the time, making, trying in a hundred different ways. And trying not to get upset on the basis of what? Not a forced kind of robotic calmness. On the basis of self-knowledge. Chidananda Rupa Shiboham. I am that. Not by uh, repeating it. Mechanically, by seeing it's a fact. Why should I be upset? Why should I be upset? Don't let the world upset your mind. Don't let anything disturb your serenity. That's a tremendous practice. You might say it's easier said than done. That's why it's a practice. That's why Shankaracharya says it's strength. Without this strength, he says, you cannot have self-realization. This is before self-realization. Another thing. There's a term nowadays, spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing. It seems um, some people use some kind of spiritual logic. I am the Atman, Brahman, I am pure consciousness and I don't confront my problems. Suppose I have personality problems, moral failings or problems from the world outside. I choose to avoid it, hide my head in the um, sand like an ostrich claiming to be Brahman. No, that is spiritual bypassing. That is not what Advaita recommends. See here. It says, Na balahi neena. One must have strength. One must have strength and to face whatever life throws at, at us and be of good cheer as the Atman, as Brahman. What, what is the problem for me? I can, then I can deal with that without becoming upset. I can deal with that much more effectively, much more wisely. Otherwise, when we deal with things, respond to things from a position of being upset, fearful, scared, we, we usually think, say, and do the wrong things. We don't act at, at our potential. We don't act with the limit of, our, at the peak of our wisdom. Then he says, the second practice, na pramadat, inadvertence, carelessness. There's an ancient Indian saying, pramado vai mrityohu. Lack of mindfulness is death. So, apramada is mindfulness. Mindlessness, heedlessness is death, especially here. Keep the mind on Vedanta. Don't let it slip from Vedanta. There is a saying, 
common among monks. Asukte amrite kalam nait vedanta chintaya. Until you fall asleep and until you die, spend your time in Vedantic thought. Keep reading, thinking continuously about these things and until you fall asleep, which is pretty easy when you're thinking too much about Vedanta, you fall asleep. All right, that's all right, you fall asleep. But then you, when you wake up, start thinking about Vedanta again. And until, how long will I have to do this? Until death, until the end of this life. That's the spirit. If you become a monk, what will you do? You'll do that. That's what you, that's why, why you have become a monk for. One uh, Swami wrote to the Holy Mother saying that I'm in Rishikesh and meditating. I've repeated the mantra so many thousands and thousands of times, but the Lord has not revealed himself to me. And she wrote back saying two things. She was a little annoyed by that. She, she used to dictate her letters. Write back to him that number one, is the Lord a sack of potatoes that you can purchase him with your spiritual practice? The Lord will reveal himself to you. See, the Lord reveals uh, uh, himself to the one whom he chooses. The Atman reveals itself to the one whom it chooses. Now, that's one. The second thing she said was, he has become a monk. If he will not do japa, meditation and japa, repeat the mantra, what will he do? What's the big credit? <laughs> I have uh, done a lot of japa and meditation. So, so what's the big criteria? That's what you're going to do. Keep doing it. Shankaracharya wrote, it's a, a little uh, a hymn very popular among monks. Vedanta vakyeshu sadaramanta bhikshana matrena chatushti manta ahar nisham brahma sukhe ramanta kaupi navanta ahar nisham brahma sukhe charanta kaupi navanta khalubhagya vanta This is called five verses on the loincloth, the wearer of the loincloth. This is a monk, the wandering monk. What does it mean? Vedanta Vakyeshu Sadaramanta. Continuously dwelling, enjoying Vedanta Vakya, the Vedantic sentences, dwelling on the Vedantic sentences ever. Then the second one, Bhikshana Matre Nachadushti Mantra. Completely satisfied with whatever chance may bring the arms, the food got from arms. Bhikshana, the food got from arms. Vivekananda said, the sky thy roof, the grass thy bed, food what chance may bring, well cooked or ill, judge not. No food or drink can taint that noble self which knows itself. So, Bhikshana Matrena Chatushti Mantra, completely satisfied by whatever food um, uh, you get by begging. So, Swami Bhuteshanandaji Maharaj, the 12th president of our order, he spent a lot of time in the Himalayas as, uh, you know, in seclusion and meditation and go for begging for food. He would say the Himalayan monks have a saying among them, among themselves, um, that um, about food. Kabhi ghi ghana to kabhi mutthi bhar chana or kabhi wo bhi mana. What does that mean? Sometimes you get very rich food made in ghee, in the you know, clarified butter. Sometimes you get only a handful of gram. And sometimes you don't even get that. Kabhi ghi ghana to kabhi mutthi barchana or kabhi wo bhi mana. And you should be serene in all three. You should be serene in all three. Difficult, especially if you're hungry, but still you have to, that's the practice. Kaupi navanta kalubhagya vanta. Brahma sukhe ahar nisham ramanta. Um, ever immersed in the bliss of Brahman, in day and night immersed in the bliss of Brahman. Fortunate indeed is the wearer of the loincloth. Kopi Navanta Khalubhagyavanta. Like these five verses are there. Wonderful. Most monks, they repeat them, if not regularly, once in a while. So, he says next. So, first is, never forget. First is, of course, strength. Derive strength from living these truths. Try to live accordingly. Don't let your mind be upset. Second, don't forget. Keep your mind on Vedanta. Until you fall asleep, until you die, let the mind dwell on Vedanta. Not just before falling asleep or just before dying. <laughs> That's an excuse. <laughs> then, uh, so this is pram pramada, without any inadvertence. Don't, don't let the world um, seep into you. Then tapaso vapya lingat. So, tapas means austerity. Linga means here, 
monasticism. Shankaracharya says becoming a form, formally becoming a monk. What the Upanishad means, of course, is that the renunciation from the mind, which was already said earlier, a strong renunciation of worldliness, worldly pursuit. What Sri Ramakrishna said, pursuit of lust and gold. Strong renunciation from the mind. Those are not my goals anymore. Artha and Kama. Um, pleasure seeking and worldly success. They will come to you. They will come to you. If you are in samsara, they will come to you. But those are not your goals. We are not in samsara. To, we are not in samsara to pursue them. Uh, and Shankaracharya, he goes further and he says, the, uh, the linga, the word linga here literally means sign. Sign. So the sign is this cloth, the formal cloth of the, of the monastic. That means formally becoming a monk. Um, but it basically means the monastic, internal monastic attitude. If formally becoming a monk led to enlightenment, then everybody who became a monk would become enlightened. And nobody who did not become a monk would become enlightened. But we see throughout history until today, there are many among monks who do not become enlightened. And there are many uh, who are not monks who do become enlightened. So it's because it's because so is it is it wrong or is this teaching wrong? No. What is implied here is the inner attitude, the renunciation from the heart of lust and gold. That is what is meant by uh, this inner monasticism or inner renunciation. That one has to be monk-like insight. Um, Shankaracharya, of course, is very pro-monk. So he says, no, no, externally also. If you want to become enlightened, you study this and then. Um, live life according to the Vedantic teachings, never be inadvertent about Vedanta, keep your mind continuously, 24 by 7, huh? this is a word she would have liked, uh, is popular in America, Silicon Valley, 24 by 7, but here 24 by 7, they want to keep you engaged in job, 24 by 7, uh, monastic life is, or spiritual life, keep your mind on Vedanta. The austerities one must practice, tapasya, should be along with monasticism, or inner renunciation and external austerity. Here austerity, Shankaracharya uh, defines as jnana, the practice of shravana manana nididhyasana. Engage yourself in um, Vedantic study, reasoning and meditation after taking um, monastic vows. So this is Shankaracharya's own interpretation. People do that. Even now people are doing that. Um, Shank this Shivaratri, traditionally in India, on Shivaratri night, the new monks are initiated every year in Banaras and Haridwar and other places also. Um, a young man I knew, he wrote to me just a few days ago saying that, I'm sorry I did not tell you this earlier, very highly uh, qualified young man worked, he was working in the United States. He says, uh, on an impulse I went up to India and in Banaras this year on Shivaratri by such and such Swami. I was initiated into sannyasa, and now I'm off. He told me the name of a very famous mountain uh, where he is going to spend the rest of his life in study and contemplation. So this is becoming formally becoming a monk and following the path of um, self-knowledge. Shankaracharya says, Tapo atra jnanam lingam sannyasaha. Tapasya, austerity here means specifically the austerity of uh, Shavana Mananajidya and stick to that and becoming a formal monk. Tasya Ishatma Vishate Brahmadama. Though the Vidwan, the Vedantic student who seeks self realization by these means, living on the Vedantic truth, never letting the mind wander away from Vedantic contemplation. Where is the time to be unhappy? Where is the time to grumble? Where is the time to fight with others? Uh, where is the time to be greedy and try out this and that, be distracted by the world? Shankaracharya gives a list of things to watch out for. Laukika putra pashwadi vishaya sanga nimitta pramadat. Being diverted by main uh, uh, sources of diversion, Shankaracharya says, watch out for children, one, and cows, that means your animals. In New York, it won't be cows, it will be probably be dogs. So, <laughs> people are diverted by, so you have people, other people in your life, spouse and children, um, or the dog, 
or if you were in ancient India, the cows, you're very worried about your cows. That's basically your wealth in ancient India. Here you'd be worried about the dog or this, your Wall Street stock market portfolio, what's going up and what's going down. That is called pramada, diversion. Stay with Vedanta. Such a person, Atma Vishate Brahma Dhamma. For that person, the self enters into the abode of Brahman. Literally, what it means is you realize you are Brahman. The self is Brahman. I am Brahman. Existence, consciousness, bliss, realization comes. This is the background to it.